so so yeah i'll just um if anybody else joins i'll i'll just keep admitting them but i'll just explain a little bit about the summit um just because it's sometimes nice for for you to hear as well kind of the reason behind why i why i kind of set it up but um yeah it's it's called the self-rediscovery summit because i think a lot of the time people kind of come to self-rediscovery with the idea that we're going to fix or change something that's that's broken <laughs> and so along my journey i kind of realized that that wasn't necessarily you know the case and and whilst we can still kind of dance in being human and uh, choose you know what we play in um for me it's about kind of seeing who we are beyond that um in our wisdom and, and how we can kind of be moved from there so i'm excited to dive into that with you um in the form of relationships because we've just been exploring loads of different topics with different speakers and um, so we've, we've explored all sorts of different topics but we're always kind of pointing back to the same wisdom um so yeah we're live every friday pretty much um and yeah it's that's kind of really all it's about but it's um it's been a lot of fun so it was only meant to be kind of three months um so i've just extended it because it's <laughs> it's super fun um so yeah and also i have the self rediscovery facebook community where i kind of jump on and answer any questions um as well so um that's always nice i'm just gonna let somebody else in um yeah oh two more one second um yeah so i'm i'm really excited that you're here to share with us um about uh, relationships yeah so and i know that you have kind of been deeply impacted by um the work of the three principles that i point to um as well so um yeah it's just just nice to have uh, different people on so i'll i'll introduce you a little bit um and and relationships is an area where i kind of experienced a lot of transformation with with this understanding as well so um yeah it's lovely to to kind of dive into this topic um but to formally introduce you i guess because <laughs> there's always a formal <laughs> um you're a coach and licensed marriage uh, and family therapist and you love working with couples and helping them to reduce conflict and discord in their relationships and you and your husband work with couples who are struggling and couples who would like to deepen the love and intimacy they already have and um, you work with couples from all over the world, offering private intensives that rewild relationships back to their natural state of love, which I loved when I heard that. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> um, and you're also the author of Marriage, the Soul Centered Soul Centered Series, Book One. And you and Angus are co-founders of the Soul Centered Series, Psychology, Spirituality, and the Teaching of Sydney Banks. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the formal. <laughs> so I thought I'd leave it to you to share um kind of a, a more human version of, <laughs> of all that. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, how I normally start is just to kind of invite you there, because I know people kind of like a bit of a personal journey. So if you want to start with that, that would be great. I don't know. It's um, really, yeah, up to you how you want to share. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I can, I can start with a personal journey. And I think that's uh, a, a good human introduction, because I think really on the human level, it's like, I'm human, just like the rest of you. And that's enough of an introduction. <laughs> so, um, you know, I came across this understanding and sort of different, um, different levels of introduction. So I first read the relationship handbook and didn't know that it was about the teachings of Sydney Banks. I didn't realize that there was a philosophy behind it. Um, but yet, even without knowing that, that book had an impact on myself and on my relationship with Angus. And it really was helpful at a very difficult time in our marriage where we were uh, briefly separated. And it, it gave us enough of a foundation to actually find hope again and be willing to kind of um, keep going together, but it wasn't enough of an enough of an understanding where I really uh, uh, was able to understand what had happened and why we were able to get back together. And I was still living with a certain amount of resignation within the relationship. And at that time, it really looked like the resignation was, um, you know, just what you have to do uh, to make relationships work. And it was pretty much based on him being how he is. And it was not about me at all. So it was very much a, a finger pointing, blaming kind of resignation. And it wasn't as an extreme as it had been previous to that, but it was still there. And another way that I'll talk about it is that I felt, you know, good enough to be one foot in, but not good enough to be two foot in. 
and two feet in. Yeah. And that was really, uh, at the time, the best that I could do. And I didn't see how painful that was for myself, let alone how difficult that is for relationships when um, I was constantly sort of uh, allowing myself to kind of look at, well, you know, what, what if, you know, what's my plan B? How am I going to get out of this if it, if it doesn't work? And I wasn't really allowing the full creative potential um, that's within me and within all of us to really see what the possibilities were in the relationship. So I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, several years after that, um, I then came across Michael Neal and uh, again, I didn't know that I was going to be having another experience with the principles, but I was uh, really feeling burnt out in my work as a therapist at that time. And I was thinking that I needed to do a career change or, you know, shift something up. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll get certified as a coach. Maybe that will help me figure things out. And so through that program at the time, it was uh, before his program was a principles-based uh, coaching program. Mm -hmm. And so there was one weekend where um, Michael was, uh, he had George and Linda Pransky come and speak to the group for that one weekend. And that was the weekend that focused on the understanding of the principles and what Sidney Banks shared. Yeah. And I was really, really struck by it. I was really um, impacted, but again, I didn't really understand why I felt more peaceful, why um, I had less on my mind. I knew that I'd been impacted and that was the result of it, but it was still not clear to me uh, what was different. And I just knew based on how they were sharing that they weren't teaching me to do more work. Mm -hmm. They weren't teaching me how to you know, learn new techniques. They weren't giving me more to do. Yeah. And yet even with that, I was feeling better. And that had never occurred to me before. Like really, I, I had really bought into the idea that I needed to heal my issues in order to feel better. And that I needed to work my process in order to feel better. And it was through um, that psychological work that I would get to a deeper spiritual experience. Like I'd always um, been looking in the direction of my authentic self, my true nature. But I thought there were um, there was work to be done to get there, mm -hmm. and I didn't see at the time that the work that I was doing was all about trying to improve my psychology, trying to improve myself, and that ultimately was just making me more and more miserable. Yeah, and I didn't see the connection at that time between having that orientation to my own well-being and and happiness, and the ripple effect of that on the rest of my life and my relationship being one of the big areas that it rippled out into. And, um, and I think what would happen is that I would get exhausted or discouraged about trying to fix myself. So then I would go and try and put my energy in trying to fix Angus thinking that, Oh, if he were better then I'll be happier, <laughs> which I think is a really common, like it's yeah. not a crazy misunderstanding that I felt that way. I yeah. think it's really common that people think that um, if their partner were different, they would feel better. And I want to be really clear um, in what I'm saying, because um, sometimes people misunderstand what I say. And I want to be clear that I'm not condoning bad behavior. And I'm not saying that people have to stay in relationships that they don't want to stay in. It's a personal choice about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Yeah. But what I think is really important is that understanding that our experience is not coming from the other person is liberating and empowering and huge. And just because our experience comes from inside of ourself doesn't mean we have to stay in an abusive situation or in mm -hmm. uh, a relationship that really our, um, our deeper wisdom is saying don't stay. So I want to be clear that uh, having an understanding where experience comes from to me was incredibly liberating and empowering. And I've seen that for many, many people, men and women. Yeah. And 
it doesn't mean that you just accept what happens and you don't do anything. So, and if there's questions about that, I'm happy to speak to that, but I just want to put out that disclaimer out front. Yeah. I love that. I love that you've kind of dived into that because that was something I had in mind to speak about because in my own kind of journey with the principles, um, I was, I was married and, and kind of not really enjoying being married and, and I had heard somewhere along the way in the principles that, you know, you can make anything work. <laughs> and, um, and I guess kind of what I came to see was that, yeah, actually you can, you know, it was a much more peaceful, loving relationship than there was still, you know, love there. And, 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 but when I came to kind of see eventually it kind of wisdom just made that separate. And, and it was, it wasn't like I ended up making a choice about that. It kind of just happened. Um, so mm -hmm. there is kind of a wisdom with that as well. And, and so I think that's a really lovely point to kind of raise, but, um, but yeah, I'm kind of wanting to dive into <laughs> to how yeah. we don't have to work on it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Especially because sometimes people um, maybe not have come, have maybe not come across the principles in these conversations before. And we've been exploring them all the way through. But if, if there's someone new, then maybe they might not even understand what the principles are. So maybe you could, um, yeah, share a little bit yeah. about that and how they work with, with the... Absolutely. And, um, you know, I often... Uh, don't even talk specifically about the principles and refer to uh, kind of the understanding that was shared by Sydney Banks because there's um, so many different ways to hear what he was teaching and what he was sharing. And, and for me, what resonates most is that he was pointing to the truth that every single one of us has a true nature that is within us, that is not uh damaged in any way by what's happened to us in our life mm. by what our circumstances are that that is an infinite internal resource that we can't know with our intellect but we can feel its presence and ultimately it's it's a mystery and it's the unknown but we can be open to that and experience it and and feel it within ourselves and he was pointing all of us to look in that direction of who we really are. And I think that is the fundamental understanding that he was sharing. Yeah. And that when we do that, it impacts every single area of our life. Yeah. That when we understand who we are beyond our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and feel into this infinite capacity of the self, we awaken to possibilities that we didn't see previously. And he also shared more on the psychological level in terms of helping us see what gets in the way of us being able to see more of who we are and experience that more deeply. And basically what he points to is that the only thing that creates that experience of separation within ourself, that experience of suffering within ourself is identifying with our own thoughts, that that is the source of suffering mm -hmm. and that it's not, the point is not to identify the source of suffering so it eliminates suffering because I don't think that we can ever yeah. really uh, never identify with thought or maybe some people can but most of us myself in that category um, still gets caught up and still identifies with thinking and that gets in the way of me feeling that deeper place within myself that deeper space yeah. but understanding what's happening even though it's happening to me is really transformative and freeing and liberating yeah that's my experience too and that it's kind of like we don't we don't really need to know what the principles are so much you know or it's kind of feeling them and so just when when we explain them or explore them i guess um and we feel it we get a feel for them um, yeah that's when it kind of yeah yeah so for anyone who doesn't know what the principles are, the, the terms that are used are mind, consciousness, and thought. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really important to listen to what Nicole just said, because if you try to understand what the principles of mind, consciousness, and thought are, it typically gets us in our head and trying to analyze and figure things out. But what Nicole's pointing to is it's really pointing to that feeling of true nature, and that's what is um, your guide, and that's where your wisdom comes from. And Sydney Banks used those terms as a way of, of pointing to the true self, to your authentic self. 
and he's the only person that really understands them. I, I know that I don't understand them. And so I, I tend <laughs> we not have to. have our own interpretation of them. I yes, think. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Which so, is everyone is different. <laughs> exactly. So you, nobody's going to give you the same um, explanation. But I'll, I'll say for me, when I hear those terms, what I understand him to be pointing to in terms of thought is that we have the capacity to think and that that capacity to think allows us to have an experience. But you can't have thought without having consciousness, because if we had thought without consciousness, we wouldn't be aware of any of our thoughts. So we still wouldn't be able to have an experience. So consciousness gives us the ability to witness our thoughts and have an experience. And mind is a way of pointing to that infinite energy, that intelligence behind life that that fuels everything. And so he pointed to the three together, mind, consciousness, and thought working together as a way to bring that formless spiritual energy into the world of form so that we can have a human experience. And, and you don't need to understand the principles to know that you're having a human experience. You've got your own experience that lets <laughs> you know that. And understanding though that your experience is created and that it's, it's changeable, that your moods go up and down based on what thoughts you're identifying with. Understanding that if experience is created, it's coming from within. It's not being created outside of you. You're creating your experience of reality and your experience is going to change based on the quality of your, the quality of your thinking in the moment. And I, I see that all the time for myself where I'll be in a really good feeling, lighthearted mood, not caught up in my thinking, and I'll, I'll be with a situation and feel absolutely fine with it. And then I can get really caught up in my thoughts, get anxious, get insecure. And then all of a sudden, the same situation looks far worse, far different. The reality around it changes, but nothing's changed other than my state of mind and what I'm identifying with. And that's really apparent in relationships, really apparent, whether it's with your um, significant other, your children, your family members, like we all have relationships in our life. And I'm sure every single one of you can recognize how certain people can look different depending on the mood that you're in. <laughs> and that would happen with Angus before where I would really think, at times that I cannot be married to this man. Look at him, look at how he behaves, look at how he treats me, this is not okay. Um, and then there'd be times where it's the same person and I'm totally in love with him and adore him and would not want to not have him in my life. And so it, it, it didn't, it wasn't obvious to me, which is kind of funny now, but it wasn't obvious to me at the time that when I thought that I couldn't be married to him, that that wasn't a problem with the relationship that needed to be fixed. And that when I was in love with him and wanting to be in the relationship, that looked to me like, well, um, I'm just not looking at the problem in this moment. It still needs to be fixed. And so I've got to, in this good place, kind of try and fix the relationship problems from here. And obviously that would usually end up leaving that good feeling pretty fast as soon as I started to go down that territory. And that's kind of where Angus and I came up with this um, metaphor of rewilding love and relationships, because what we, we saw for ourselves in our relationship is that, you know, we got to some pretty dry patches in our relationship where it really looked like there wasn't a lot of love. I mentioned how we, you know, were separated briefly. Um, you know, we really got discouraged and it looked a bit like a desert at times in mm. terms of what was possible and we would lose hope. But it was amazing to see how little it took for the love to come back in. And that's the rewilding process that we're pointing to. And if you think about nature, you can have this parched desert and a little bit of rain and all of a sudden the cacti are in bloom again and you start to, to see that intelligence behind life expressing itself in whatever ways it does. Yeah. And so, I love yeah. I love nature as, yeah. a, as an example because it's just so perfect, isn't it? It's like clearly visible that that is kind of the natural intelligence of life. And right. I think when we realize that's within us as well, it's so 
kind of profound and and yet so obvious at the same time like you say it's like (laughs) it's kind of like when you see it you're like oh (laughs) yeah and and like you said we are nature I've heard some people say that recently when we've been talking about this metaphor realizing that they aren't separate from nature they are nature and that intelligence we are that intelligence we are that um, energy of life wanting to be expressed in this world and so to to see that it's a very different orientation than trying to fix and improve and ameliorate which is sort of the direction that angus and i used to go in in terms of our relationship in fact before this call we were talking and um we were we were sharing about um you know a video that we might do a vlog we might do and he was saying yeah maybe i'm gonna share about those times that i would sit outside in the waiting room of um the office of the therapist that we would see for our um, marriage counseling. And he said he would sit there and he would see people coming out really distressed in tears. Mm. And then we would go in and then we would leave feeling worse than we did when we went in because we'd spend an hour or even maybe 90 minutes focusing on what wasn't working and Mm. trying to figure out how to fix what wasn't working by practicing communication skills and practicing techniques. And, and I actually never used to feel that bad because I would kind of be like the A student and be like, Oh, I can do this. I'm a trained psychologist. I can practice these things. And Angus would feel like, Oh, you know, she's, she's, she's got this and I don't have it. And so it would just, it created like this feeling of hierarchy in the relationship, which wasn't helpful. And again, I'm not saying that people can't get help from therapists, but it's really important to check out that it is helping and that it is making a difference because we yeah. spent time and money, um, you know, ending up feeling more discouraged and worse and probably would have ended the relationship if we'd kept going in that direction and looking in that direction for a really long time. So you yeah. just have to be and aware what, of that. What, what occurs to me there is it's almost like, cause I've done the same thing and it's almost like in my experience, at least it felt like we were just, now looking back kind of just going round and round and round in thought bubbles like each other's thought bubbles and it was just getting more and more angry it's yeah. kind of like oh yeah maybe this isn't so helpful yeah we can we can get on these loops because we can't uh shift the relationship by working on the relationship because mm. the relationship is a byproduct it's a byproduct of the state of mind of the two people in the relationship. And so if you try to fix something that's a byproduct, you're not really addressing what's ultimately driving the end result. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like if we're, we're looking at the end result and trying to fix it after the fact, and that just doesn't work. So what, what happened, and this happened in a very inadvertent way, Um, for me in terms of our relationship. But what happened was through looking in the direction of having this experience of okayness and well-being inside of myself, and for me to wake up to the, the truth that I saw that my emotional experience that would go up and down did not need to be fixed, that there was no problem in any of that. And I didn't have to like my experience but I didn't have to fight it or try to change it. And in fact, the fighting it and trying to change it was what was causing so much stress and um, discouragement within myself because I was trying to fight something that doesn't need to be fixed. It's like trying to, you know, fix a river. The river is flowing and it's going to keep flowing. It doesn't need to be fixed. It's meant to be flowing. And my emotional experience is meant to be flowing. That's just, it's design. And there's nothing wrong with the fact that we all have different experiences that are part of that. And it's all part of that innate intelligence of how we're all designed. And I was spending my energy thinking that I needed to have more good experiences and less bad experiences. Mm -hmm. And that attempt was what was creating a lot of suffering in my life. And it was exhausting me. It was the reason why I was feeling burnt out at work. It was also the reason that I wasn't in such a great um, feeling of love within myself. And so that rippled out into my relationship with Angus. And so as soon as I, I felt an incredible release in seeing that, that I could stop trying to improve myself like it was just so freeing to get off of that treadmill 
and to really see that the human experience does not need to be fixed yeah. and that I'm not broken because I have a human experience that includes feelings that I don't like, that yeah. that's okay. That's so and that I have the resilience yeah. to handle them. Yeah, that's such a beautiful way of kind of, because I think often, again, we can kind of um, hear it bandaged around that we need to accept things. And, and it's like, that almost feels like a doing, but, but this understanding kind of, it's almost like a, a something that occurs, <laughs> is acceptance occurs by just seeing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, we can't do acceptance, you're right. But when we realize that our psychology is normal, and we understand that it's just a reflection of the thoughts we're identifying with in the moment and that thoughts are going to come and go, that we don't need to worry about the content of them and the fact that we get caught up in them. Like none, none of that is a problem, that that's just what it is to be human. Yeah. And that behind all of this up and down of our, our moods and thoughts and experience is this deeper intelligence, yeah. is the energy of who we are. And that, you know, I've heard Dick and Bettinger say that there's the 96% and the 4%. That's the metaphor yeah. I've heard him use, where the 4% is our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and the 96% is this infinite unknown of who we are. And when we really see like, oh, this 4% is doing just fine, no matter what's in it, we don't need to fight it or react to it. And there's this incredible infinite, not really 96%, but infinite being that we have available to us that we drop into all the time that is very ordinary i mean we've probably all had peak experiences where we get these like you know big light bulb moments of it but i also want to recognize that it's just as ordinary as um having a quiet moment and you know feeling relaxed in that moment just as ordinary as feeling some peace before you fall asleep at night, just as ordinary as um, feeling joy when you wake up before all the worries come in, you know, whatever those moments might be to see that that's an experience of your true nature yeah. and it's happening always. We all naturally fall out of thought at some point. Yeah. And we probably all want to fall out of thought more often and stay there longer, but it doesn't <laughs> matter. And the more that we try to, to um, chase that, the, the, the less happy we feel. And I can speak to that from personal experience. Yeah, I think it's something we've kind of been conditioned, you know, I, within the self-help industry, even with kind of all the positivity and, and affirmations and things, it's like we kind of almost try to bypass the, the human experience it's as if like it's not normal. <laughs> it's like, exactly. no, it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's, I spent a long time trying to yeah. um, improve myself and what I realized exactly what you said, Nicole, is I was trying to eradicate the human experience and just yeah. be a spiritual being, just be this, this formless energy, which is not what this experience on earth is about. We're, we're living in, we're having an experience of form. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what, what we're doing, or that's what we're here. But it doesn't mean that there's not this deeper spiritual essence that is behind it all. And it's, you know, Sydney Banks would say we can have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. that we can be um, in the experience of who we are and also play in the world of form and be in the dance of our humanity mm -hmm. and, and learn and grow from this experience, which I think is you know, probably what it's designed for. I don't know for sure, but it seems like it's an incredible learning curve that I'm on. And I think that you know, we can probably all recognize we're on that. Yeah. And so, so to get back to the relationship piece that it was through me feeling that weight off my shoulders that I dropped more into this feeling of I'm okay in a way that I hadn't experientially known that I was okay because I had always assumed that when I felt badly that I was not okay, that that meant that I was not okay. And all of a sudden I had a different understanding inside of myself where I, I could see that, oh, I'm okay. And that's completely independent of what I'm feeling out here or in my emotional level, because I was very sensitive to my feeling state. I was very tuned into using that as a feedback mechanism to tell me I was not okay, and I better do something about it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I realized, I, oh, that doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean I'm not okay. It just means I'm having an experience that's going to come and go, and that I'm okay while that's happening. Yeah. Now that was hugely transformative in all areas of my life, 
but specifically in the relationship area, what happened was I hadn't seen it, but I was having a lot of experiences of feeling unsafe in the relationship because I would get upset and then I would automatically equate that to meaning I'm unsafe, I'm not okay. And then my logic would go, well, if Angus, you know, were different, if he weren't irritable right now, or if he were nicer to the kids or whatever his transgression was in that moment, his, you know, lack of perfection, that that needed to change and then I would feel safe. Mm -hmm. And that was really, you know, I don't want to blame myself for all of our relationship problems, but that shift made such a huge difference in our relationship that it's like, wow, you know, the chain of events that would flow from there was, um, it could get to some pretty difficult places. So what happened was when I felt more well-being inside of myself, we had a situation, probably some people on the call have, have heard this, but I'll share it for, for those um, for those who haven't heard it, but even for those who have, it, because defining moments, it's not so much about what happened in the defining moment for me that's important for you. It's seeing what it reflects to you about your own wisdom and knowing. And so that's really what I want you to listen for. But the, the you know, one of the pivotal moments that happened in our relationship was when we got into our familiar dance where, you know, I said something, I felt it was pretty innocent, I wasn't in, in a bad way, and Angus took it personally and was not in a good place, and he responded with some level of anger. Not probably a lot, but some level of anger. And what would normally happen was I would say my thing, he would respond with whatever his level of anger was, and I would feel hurt. I would take it personally. I would um, be really pained. And then I would respond. And I could respond with anger, or I might respond with judgment. I mean, some form of anger. It could be judgment, criticism, could be whatever. And it would just, you know, escalate from there. Now, in this situation, I didn't feel any pain. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying not to feel pain. I wasn't using a technique not to feel pain. I just didn't take what he said personally. Now, he was upset. And so when I didn't respond, he was waiting for, you know, me to lob the next, the next <laughs> comment. And so he's like, you know, he wants to lob his comment. He's, he's used to the dance. And so he did. And, he, you know, he was upping the ante, even though I wasn't upping the ante in that moment. And I still didn't respond. And again, I wasn't hurt. And he was at this point, you know, he was like, what is going on here? What's happened to you? And I think he went to the place of maybe she doesn't care. Like, I think he got a little worried that I just didn't care anymore. And he asked me, you know, why I wasn't reacting to what he was saying. And I honestly said, you know, that I could see that he was suffering. And I genuinely felt compassion for the fact that he was suffering and that he wasn't really himself in that moment like his behavior was not really who i know him to be and he was just having a bad moment and i could see that and it was in the seeing that that i saw it wasn't personal to me yeah, that it really beautiful. had nothing to do with me yeah that's really beautiful and um, there, was, there was someone once who said to me um, um how could they not love you if they could see the real you and mm -hmm. I liked that. I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of, and that reminds yeah. me of what you just kind of said. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. That's quite it's it's like, I, I could still see the real Angus, <clears throat> even though his behavior wasn't measuring up to, to that in that moment, yeah, but I knew that was, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to say that I can do that all the time, but seeing that so clearly then makes it so much easier to do that more often now. And even when I do take things personally now, I, I tend to realize like, oh, this is a reflection of me being caught up. It's not really a reflection of how he's behaving. Mm -hmm. and, and what was really important for me about that experience when I kind of <clears throat> learned from it, because I could, I, it's not like I, I was doing anything intellectually in the moment, it just comes, was happening. But I could see what shifted was that I had a, deeper experience of my own safety and well-being inside of myself and that his anger didn't take away that experience from me mm. that I had that and it could not be taken away from me there was nothing he could do now you know he wasn't behaving in any outrageous way and if let's say he was 
um, physically violent with me, I could still have that experience and not stay in the room. And, you know, I could still call 911 if I needed to, like, that was not what was happening. I want to be clear, but I, I want to make this distinction because some people have, um, get confused about it, that you can have an inner sense of safety and well-being, and you still might have to take action, you know, just because that wasn't the situation and what was going on with Angus and I, you're going to have to listen to your wisdom in your situation, whatever comes forward for you. Mm -hmm. But in our situation, I could see that I was in a place of safety and well-being inside of myself that, you know, was not shaken by him being destabilized. And as soon as that happened, it meant that the domino effect didn't have to occur. Mm -hmm. And when the domino effect didn't occur, we basically didn't throw away the rapport in our relationship out of our reactivity, that we were able to, um, you know, have our human experience, but still see more clearly that we're just in a state of upset in that moment, mm -hmm. that it's not something that is, um, predictive about the relationship. It doesn't mean anything about the other person. And for me, this was hugely helpful for having two imperfect human beings in a relationship, being able to navigate that because neither one of us is perfect. It's not like neither one of us ever uh, will stop getting destabilized at times, but all of a sudden I had room for Angus's humanness. I had room for my humanness. And he probably all along had more room for humanness all along than I ever did. But it, it kind of allowed him to sort of, uh, you know, not feel judged, not feel criticized, not feel not good enough, because pretty much that was the message that I was giving him, that he really wasn't good enough, um, that, yeah, there were good times, but ultimately when things would go south, it would be because he wasn't good enough. And again, I, I am very humbled by this. I see my arrogance. I see... Uh, the lack of humility. I see my inability to kind of look at what I was doing and recognize that uh, all of that was a reflection of my own insecurity and my own fears. Mm -hmm. And so for, you know, when it comes to rewilding relationships, it has to start with connecting with that place inside of you. Yeah, deeply. I love that. And what I what I kind of am hearing from that as well um, is that it's kind of, you, can, you know, because when we when we talk about relationships, often um, not from this sort of perspective, it's like we both have to work on the relationship. Whereas actually, it just took you having an insight um, that kind of shifted the whole dynamic and energy. And yeah, and, and yeah. that's what I kind of love, because it's like, we don't both have to understand the principles for <laughs> our relationships yeah, to be true. better because it's kind of like it's coming from us and when we see like you say that place of well-being and resilience in in us being not impacted by anybody else that's kind of where the transformation is and it's not because I think it's very tempting and I know for me it was it was like well you need to understand the principles too and then <laughs> and then it will all be fine <laughs> yeah and yeah. I came to see that that was yeah that was made up <laughs> It is made up. And, and at that point, it's true. Like Angus, because I had sort of said, oh, you, this is what I'm learning. This is what I'm doing. And like, he wasn't interested. I, I dragged him to so many different things. He'll tell that story of being dragged <laughs> to workshops under ultimatums about our marriage. And he's like, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> and, and he knew nothing about what I was doing. And, um, and yet, it, you're right, it absolutely shifted our relationship. And it was because of that shift he saw in me that was sustainable and, and he could see how authentic it was that that was actually what got him interested and in like, well, maybe I do want to know what she's up to. Something's <laughs> going on here that I haven't seen before. Yeah. And, and so, so yeah, and, and I know I, I want to be conscious of the time and I want to make sure that we can have time for questions. So yeah. Yeah. Just want to open that up. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions right now? Does anybody want to come on live and ask a question? Um, just kind of raise your hand or, or pop, um, pop um, something in the group chat to let us know. Um, otherwise, we can we can keep talking. Yeah, um, I'm happy to keep going, but yeah. I just want to, I know that we're yeah. almost 40 minutes in. Okay. So yeah, if anybody does want to, to come on and, and ask, this is your chance. And, and again, you can pop that in. It was oh, Heidi's good. waving her hand. Oh, well, let me see. Hang on. <laughs> let me, um, Heidi, I'll unmute you. Okay. Gosh, <laughs> I don't really know what I'm going to say. That's totally um, fine. Okay. So 
So talking about relationships, um, so I've, I'm separated from my husband at the moment and he, he separated us and, you know, when he first did it, I took it really personally and then, and then I didn't and then I did and then I didn't and I've been going up and down the whole time. It's been 10 months now. And um, so that was in July and then I met this, the three principles in November and, you know, I read the, um, you know, the, the George Pransky book. And when I read that, I was just having all these mad feelings of, oh my God, I can't believe what I've done. I, you know, I've got to get back with him and, you know, give him the book and la 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 la. Anyway, um, you know, I've done so many things to kind of um, make him kind of, to, to kind of um, confirm to him that he's done the right thing. I've, I've just been abominable. And they're his words. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I've just behaved like a complete child on many levels. Um, but the thing is, you know, I, I can see so much of, um, I'm, I'm learning so much about myself through this experience. And, you know, what is my question? My question is, you know, when you kind of, you know, I regret lots of the things I've done. Um, and, um, but, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't have prevented them, you know, and, and, you know, if I do it again, <laughs> you know, there's nothing I can do. Do you know what I mean? I, I, there's nothing I can do if I do it again, but, you know, each time I do it, I do this thing, whatever I do, you know, I call it throwing my toys out of the pram, you know, literally, um, you know, I then think, oh, I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. You know, and I really believe that. And on some, you know, some days I feel, oh, it's, you know, I really do think, okay, it's absolutely fine that this has happened and, you know, I'm going to grow. And, you know, maybe if I was still with him, because it was all about him kind of looking after me and me not doing anything for him. It was all about what I can get from him. And now I look back. I wasn't aware of that then, but now I can see that I was just grabbing whatever I could get. And he was amazing. And I was such a bitch, but I never realized that before. Mm -hmm. so, you know, and I'm trying to show him that I'm not a bitch anymore, but I keep behaving like one because the minute he does, I can see that he doesn't believe me, that he doesn't mm -hmm. see the real me. Then I start revert back to, you know, that bad behavior. And, you know, maybe it's not meant to be, you know, um, no one has the answer, but I have kind of come back and tried to kind of maneuver us getting back together. But it's like, it's not going to happen that way. You know, it's like, I don't know, I wish I could um, not feel sensitive to him rejecting me because it feels like every time I try and start it up again, he rejects me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I think, oh, you know, we're not meant to be and then you know I'm listening to you talking there and it's like oh maybe we are meant to be do you know what I mean it's like I just can't settle with what I really think you know what you know it's like you know some people get this you know that they they feel this feeling and and and, it, and it's stuck whereas with me I'm I'm all over the place you know I just I don't know what's happening I don't know if you can say anything to that <laughs> I'll, 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 share, I'll share some thoughts that come up and you can let me know if there's, you know, um, any, anything else that you'd like to, you know, more specific. But the first thing I want to say is that you acknowledging that, you know, you did the best that you could based on what you saw at the time and to really see your psychological innocence and your husband's psychological innocence uh -huh. and, and, and now to see your psychological innocence because we all do the best we can based on what our understanding is. And, and we can't expect more than our best. That has to be, you know, good enough. And so for you to really um, feel that and, and, and feel the truth in that, because to me that takes the pressure off of you having to be any different. It's like you're doing the best you can based on what you see. And it sounds like you're seeing things in a, in a really significant way. And that's going to continue to deepen and unfold. And and in the area of where, um, you know, you get upset and you feel rejected, that's, that is a, a growing edge for you. And 
that experience is one of those experiences where it looks like his behavior is creating that experience inside of you where you don't feel safe and then you react, which is what you do when you don't feel okay. It's like, that's the way that you've learned how to do that. But the more that you see that for what it is and that whatever his um, comments or reactions are, that those are just a reflection of his state of mind. Um, you know, what, what he's identifying with in the moment and they don't mean anything about you. And the experience of rejection is the experience of identifying with your own beliefs about not being good enough or whatever those are, whatever those stories are. And I am very familiar with those stories too, but the more you can kind of get that big picture perspective where he says whatever he's saying, but you're also able to see that what you're feeling is coming from this loop that's going on up here for you. Yeah. And that that's where the power or the empowerment is that's where the freedom is. It's not about what he's saying yes or no to, or even how he's responding. It's about you seeing that, oh, all of that story is not true. None of it is true. Yeah. It's made up and you don't have to identify with it. Or even if you are identifying with it, you don't have to um, believe what the content is while you identify with it. It's like you can be caught up and just know that you're caught up and that it's eventually going to pass and you're going to come back to your regular state. Like there's different levels of being an acceptance of what is. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the more you see where your experience is coming from, which it sounds like you're seeing profoundly based on what you've shared, the easier that will get to recognize even in that situation that's a real hot spot for you. You'll be able to sort of pull back and see the bigger picture and have more freedom within yourself. And whatever happens in the relationship is what happens in the relationship. To me, what's important is that you know that you're okay, fundamentally okay, whether you're in the relationship or not in the relationship, and that nobody can reject you from yourself, that that is not something that can be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. And if this relationship isn't the relationship that you're gonna be in, having that connection within yourself, you will be able to enjoy another relationship if that's, if that's what's meant, you know, if that's what unfolds. I don't know, I can't predict that. Yeah. But for me, that relationship with the truth of who you are, that's what you wanna be looking to and you will become more and more clear about it. So whatever his reaction is, it's not gonna send you into that kind of tailspin or it will be less frequently that you get sent into that kind of tailspin. But I really wanna encourage you to be gentle with yourself and to not judge, you know, the, I love the, the metaphor of throwing the toys out of the pram, to just know that that's the best you can do in that moment based on the level of fear and insecurity that you're feeling. Like that's the best way you can take care of yourself. You're learning more, you're gonna see more. But when that happens, forget about um, him, forget about the relationship, forget about um, anything outside of yourself. That's the time to connect with who you are or, or not even connect with it because we can't usually feel it in those moments, but it's a time to remember to take care of yourself while you're having that experience. And mm -hmm. it will, it's the kindness toward yourself at those moments. And those are oftentimes the times we judge ourselves the harshest. And what I'm saying is you wanna see that those are the times to really be as kind and gentle with yourself as you possibly can. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's really gorgeous. And thank you for sharing that so openly, Heidi, as well, because that's a really beautiful um, learning for us all. But I don't know if it's worth me just sharing as well, because I've had a kind of similar experience and saw something in that as well because my my partner left me and and that I took that to mean something about who I was because my my dad had abandoned me when I was four and so I had a lot of thinking about that and um and so yeah through that experience I, I did exactly the same thing and kind of took it to mean something about me until I kind of realized one day that actually even though my partner had left there was still love there because I still felt love and and what I realized was that that meant actually love was there regardless of whether he was there because it was actually coming from me. And so I kind of realized in that, oh, 
I'm love. And, and so I, I didn't know if that was something to explore, Rahini, because I know you talk about kind of rewilding relationships to the natural state of love. Um, and so I don't know whether that's kind of something you, you wanted. Yeah, to, that, that's you know. absolutely a great example of illustrating that point, because that is our natural state. Love is our natural state. It is who we are. We don't always feel it, but that is the essence. And, and that is what when we relax and um, aren't caught up, we fall into our natural state naturally because it's our natural state. Yeah. And that's what we experience when we're there. We experience our hearts being open. We experience compassion. We experience empathy. We're naturally kind. We don't need to work at being loving. We're just in that state inside of ourselves and we're naturally loving. We're naturally kind. We're naturally empathetic. And it doesn't require extra effort. And if we're putting effort in and, and trying to improve ourselves, if we're in that game, what it means is that we're not relaxed into our natural state. It means that we're caught up. And the more we're caught up, the less we're gonna be able to show up as our natural selves. And the more pressure we put on ourselves when we're caught up, the worse we feel and the worse we show up ultimately. Yeah. And, and we get confused and we put more pressure on ourselves during the times when we actually need less pressure on ourselves. Yeah. And also during those times, I feel like it's almost where insight's just ready to, when we hit up against the edge, it's like insight just comes in. Cause I just remember seeing so clearly, I was like, Oh, well he's not here, but love is still here. Cause I still feel it. Mm -hmm. And so I realized, Oh no, that, that's cause it's coming from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that is such a great reminder, Nicole, for all of us to, to really see where does that experience of love come from? Mm. And, and when we see where it comes from, we then know that it can't be taken away from us. Yeah. And even, you know, um, you know, you mentioned what happened with your father, you know, I had a, you know, similar experience of not being able to see my dad from quite a young age. And I spent a lot of my life believing that I wasn't lovable as a result of that and mm. thinking, you know, in, in misguided ways that if I had been better, then that wouldn't have happened and those kinds of things. And, yeah. and ultimately, when I did reconnect with him in my mid-20s, what I realized was that the love was there all along and that I had just made up a story yeah. about it yeah. and that he didn't take the love away from me. Yeah. that it was inside of me. And of course, as children, we don't understand that. And I wouldn't expect the child to know that. No. But it is such maybe, a... Yeah, maybe not intellectually, but I guess it's, I don't know, maybe when we're born, we know that. <laughs> if we yeah, I think we do know it, but then we make up these yeah. stories as kids. It's like, it's not true. So it's not that children can't know that. It's, yeah, it's a good point. So I guess, you know, when, when it looks like the world's impacting us at that age, we make meaning out of it. And that's what exactly. I kind of discovered. And until I saw it differently and just realized, no, you know, we are love. That's kind of who we are. When we talk about, yeah. you know, who we are, that's another word for, you know, another label. There's loads of different labels for who we are. Um, but for me, that was just another word for it. It's like, yeah. yeah that's, so yeah. I love that when you talked about our natural state of love. Um yeah, has anybody got any more questions? There's one in the um, group chat. So um, Khalifa says, Mr. Sydney Banks says, look for a feeling. Can you explore on that, please? Sure, I'll speak a little bit to that. And it can be confusing because I'll talk about sort of how feelings and moods go up and down. And then um, it's like, well, what feeling are we looking for then? Is, you know, is, and it can be looked at as like, oh, I'm looking for a good psychological feeling. And obviously, I, I not obviously, I didn't actually get to meet Sidney Banks in person. I've studied with a lot of his students who learned from him. So, you know, I'm going to base that off of what um, I've learned along the way. But my understanding is the feeling that he's talking about is not a, a psychological good feeling. It's a deeper feeling that is what we recognize when we're touching into that uh, infinite space of self, the true nature within ourselves. And we recognize the feelings and the qualities of that are, are the ones that I mentioned earlier of unconditional love, of compassion, of empathy. There's just these hallmark qualities that we experience as we're feeling that open-hearted space inside of ourselves. So when I hear that being referred to when Sydney Banks would say, look for feeling, 
that's how I hear it is that he's pointing to those hallmark qualities that let you know that you're tapping into that deeper place inside of yourself. And it's, those are the, you know, I see those as the constants that we don't feel constantly, but they're there. And then we get caught up in our psychology and we don't feel it. And then we drop back in and the, the psychological feelings are the ones that come and go that change and shift all over the place. And those are, those are normal and human, but they're always changing. And what changes is, is just part of the flow. And it's not what we want to um, use as our compass point. We want to let it give us a signal in terms of what the quality of our mind is in the moment, what the quality of our thinking is. If I'm feeling really low, then I know I'm caught up and I don't really want to trust my thoughts in that moment. Um, and if I'm in the, the deeper feelings of love and compassion, then I know that I'm pretty clear and probably trust, trust myself at those times. So that, that's what comes forward for me to share about that comment. That's gorgeous. Um, I remember I had a client once who I was exploring this with and, and she just started to cry and she said, yeah, but if every thought creates a feeling, like, what does that mean? Like, like, love is made up. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> you know, love, is, <laughs> love is the wisdom. <laughs> that's just your version of it. That's, and, and she was like, oh, that's such a relief. <laughs> <laughs> so i like that because it's it's um that's a lovely way of kind of explaining the difference i guess between thought and wisdom for me is is that that deeper feeling um like unconditional love yeah yeah uh, perfect are there any other questions does anybody else want to join us and come on um just drop your name in the um or message in the group chat because i can't quite see everyone um in there oh we've got danielle just one second uh where are we I'm trying to unmute you <laughs> oh you're unmuted Is that unmuted yeah am i unmuted Hi. oh great great um hey rohini good to see you um, yeah i know nice to see you um so this is this has been an area um that has really been a, a big eye opener for me. I, I divorced eight years ago, and then I've been dating a, a gentleman for about four, four and a half years. And I think I realized that I've spent a lot of time giving a lot of meaning to my thoughts in regards to our relationship. So if, if something felt unsettling, or if I recognized like a difference in our personalities or something that might have been uncomfortable, like immediately seeing that as like a red flag and, you know, putting a lot of attention to it. And I, I think, I think you had mentioned too, like having kind of one foot in and one foot out at all times, just to feel safe, if that mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. So um, I, I guess, so as I started to kind of let go of the attention to those thoughts, and, and I think what you stated earlier about knowing that if, if the relationship is going to take a different path, it's going to, it's going to happen naturally. And for me, that's been extremely freeing to accept that and to be able to let go of feeling like I need to make decisions here and now about my relationship and not letting it just kind of take, you know, that beautiful course on its own. Cause the gentleman I'm dating now is a, just a wonderful, wonderful human being, like such mm -hmm. a kind heart. We're totally totally different in personality um he's a really shy uh quiet individual and you know sometimes we'll, we have very different ways of approaching social situations and stuff but i'm starting to see like just the beauty of it and really loving that part and i guess when you were sharing your story something that kind of came up for me and probably part of it is just me being new in accepting to let it be and be okay and not get really caught up in my habitual thought process of like, oh my gosh, maybe we're too different. And I just go down that path and it just becomes like reality of like, what would it be like to not be with this person? And I would be okay. And not needing to go there. That's where I would typically go to is always trying to find that out mm -hmm. to be able to protect my heart and his. And so when you're sharing your story, I guess one of the questions I have 
is just kind of curious, like when you started to see that in yourself and you share that story of, you know, just feeling this compassion for Angus and then kind of stepping back and not diving into that arena of battle. Mm -hmm. But what, what took place after that for you over time? Because obviously Angus did come around and, and obviously you now have this practice where you're sharing these principles and there's a great union there. My partner, um, I talk about the things that I've learned over the last six months in the training because it's been so wonderful for me. Um, but he has not like read anything or listened to any videos or anything like that. He's, he, that hasn't been something he's been drawn to yet, but he definitely has been supportive. But it's not something where we talk about the principles, mm -hmm. you know, per se. So I just was curious, like, as you started to get in touch with that, how did that open up some of those differences you saw with Angus? Because obviously there's different personalities and how you address things and the way that, you know, some of the battles you were dealing with prior. But can you share a little bit about that, too? Because to me, that is just such a beautiful story of what's happened between your relationship coming out of a really tough spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I share a little bit and you can let me know if it's sort of the direction that you're, you're leaning, but um, you know, what was really helpful and this, like you're saying, he didn't need to know anything about the understanding, but what was mm -hmm. really helpful was that I started to understand how people's behavior is a reflection of their mood. So I could see how my behavior changed when I was in a low mood and how my thinking would change when I was in low mood. And I would be able to see how his behavior would change when he was in low mood. And I would understand that it meant, oh, he's in a low mood. Don't trust what he's saying, or I'm in a low mood. Don't trust what I'm thinking. And that became something that we could uh, understand with each other without having to have any profound understanding of the principles, but in a very practical way, just realize I, oh, look at how our perspectives shift based on what our state of mind is. And I might not have said it exactly that way, but what it did was without him even sort of putting the dots together, it meant that I was so much less reactive when he was in a low mood state. And so I didn't do what you, you know, what you described is like when he gets into a low mood, behaves a certain way. Now I'm like planning my exit. What's my strategy here? And it's, it's twofold. It's one, I knew that I would be okay no matter what. So if our relationship didn't work out, I would be fine. And I don't think I believed that before. I knew fundamentally that I would be able to handle it. It might not be easy, but I would be able to handle it. So that took the pressure off of having to get into that, figuring it out, because it's like, I'll deal with that if that ever happens. I don't need to think about it now. And the second part was that with my reactivity, uh, lessened, I would see how Angus would stabilize and come back to himself. So it got easier and easier for me to not take it seriously when he was in a bad mood. And so even now, like I can't remember, it was fairly recently, um, he was in a really low mood, which rarely ever happens in that way for him. I'm usually the one that goes into the deepest, darkest places, but he was just in a really bad mood and he was saying all this stuff. And then I realized like, oh, I don't need to consider anything that he's saying now and take it seriously. So I would just, I just said, you know, Angus, I don't think I need to take what you're saying seriously. I think it's just your low mood talking. He goes, yeah, you're probably right. And so it just took the pressure off. And so like these personality differences that you're describing, probably when you're in a good mood, they look really charming and they're part of why you're together and you're a really great balance and all of that. And then you get into a low mood and you get insecure and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe he's this way and I'm that way. And so you start to see that you can't trust your own thinking when you're in that state of mind. And that my guess is that all of those times is just a reflection of you being in a low mood. Or perhaps when he's in a low mood, some of these differences are exaggerated. Like they're, they're, you know, kind of middle of the road and then he gets into a low mood and something's a lot more extreme. And then you just get to realize like, oh yeah, that's what he's like when he's in a low mood, but he doesn't live there forever. You know, he comes back and he's back to himself again. So, so that's kind of been the learning curve for Angus and I to kind of see like, oh, we, love is our natural state for both of us. He, just not just me for him too so when he's there the relationship is great he's amazing it's effortless it doesn't require a lot of work um it's it's just we're living life and it and it flows and then because we're human 
we get caught up and it might be one of us, it might be both of us. And that when we get caught up, we can start taking our thinking seriously and we can start making plans based on that thinking that we shouldn't be taking seriously, but we get better at recognizing what we're doing. So we spend less time there. And it sounds like you're already doing that. Does that make sense? I think she's, um, I think you're back on, on mute. Uh, sorry, one second. There we go. Uh, oh no, I can't, I can't unmute you for some reason. <laughs> there we go. There am go. I? Now you are. Oh, am I, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, okay. No, I was, I was just saying, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think you realize, I noticed one thing that my, my, uh, my girlfriend had done a lot to me that I would get really like hurt by was if I was in a low mood, which is usually in the evening, cause I'm just tired, you know, from a long day and kids, if he would come by and if he could sense that I was kind of in a low mood, he would just leave pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be like, are you just, and I'd just be like, are you just like avoiding, like you're just avoiding, like what is going on? And it's been interesting as I've started to understand this, I'm like, you know what? He kind of figured it out before I did. <laughs> he was a lot yeah. wiser than me. There's <laughs> a lot of natural wisdom there. Yeah. I was like, okay, now I'm not as offended as I was before. Yeah. <laughs> it's not personal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thanks, Danielle. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, have you got time for one more, Rahini? Because we have... sure is there one more out there? Yes, it's, um, Karina. Let me just unmute you. There we go. Hi, Karina. Hi, Rahini. Hi. Um, so I've just been reflecting on the fact that when so I'm I'm interested in sort of the dating context because that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. Um, and um, I've been single for quite a number of years, very content and happy. Um, and in that state, I can very much see that I don't need to be in a relationship or not to be okay. Um, but as I fall more and more for somebody that I'm dating, that seems to suddenly get more wobbly. And mm -hmm. I just don't understand why I keep you know, losing sight of it. Um, and then I start judging myself a little bit like, oh, well, you've just not got it, have you? You haven't got that you're okay. Mm -hmm. So... I'd love if you could talk a little bit more around that and, and sort of, you know, connecting with myself more. That, that kind of st stood out for me tonight when you were talking about that. Yeah. Um, and, and the piece about taking care of yourself, something there I'm still, you know, not yeah. quite seeing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that this happened, I know this happened to me coming across this understanding and feeling so much relief that when I would get caught up, it would feel worse than it did before probably. And, and there's this, I had this expectation that I shouldn't get caught up and that I should be able to see this everywhere. And so, you know, I really want to encourage you to, to, to understand that none of us are able to see this everywhere. We all have the areas where it's more difficult for us to really see that our experience is coming from within and that we have well-being like that is part of the human condition i think part of what we're here to wake up to so you're you're on that learning curve and while you're on the learning curve what, what it sounds like is that when you're dating and you're feeling you know attracted to someone all of a sudden it looks like there's stakes in the equation like you're fine no stakes and then all of a sudden there are stakes in the equation which we know are it's thought but it doesn't make it feel any less real to you. Mm -hmm. And what we know about thought is that if we try to change it or manipulate it or um, get rid of it, well, what does it do? It makes it stronger. So it's kind of like, oh, well, you just have to kind of be with the experience as it is, mm -hmm. unless you're going to be amplifying the experience. So part of the, the learning curve as I see it is really uh, understanding that it's okay to have blind spots and it's okay to get caught up and it doesn't mean anything about you. It doesn't mean that your true nature is not right there and coming through and you will see more, like that's just gonna happen through living life. But while you're in sort of that caught up or that discomfort, it's like, can you be kind with yourself? Like that's when I'm talking about taking care of yourself. Like, can it not be a problem for you that you're insecure in those moments. Can that just be okay? Like I'm 
there's plenty of things that I would still get insecure about in life. And I have an intellectual understanding of this thought, but I don't have a visceral experiential knowing of that. But, but there can be room to just be okay with your humanness around that. Mm-hmm. And to know that it's not a problem or it's not going to ruin your dating life. It's just, hey, you get a little insecure when you like someone. It's pretty yeah. common. It's not the end of the world. It's just quite difficult to go in a relationship with a completely open heart um, and not sort of lose the balance rather than be guarded and sort of protect. I don't want to be in that, you know, yeah. from that yeah. place. I want to come from my well being. But then next thing I know, I'm, yeah, I do feel sometimes insecure maybe that's just human vulnerability that's Uh, right um, and that's better than guarded yeah right that's you on the learning curve to allow your humanness and your experience to be what it is and like oh sometimes you get a little insecure like who doesn't you know who doesn't and to know that there's room for that in love and in relationship is is room for yourself your authenticity to come forward this is um this is not about getting to this sort of state where you never feel that like that's a setup for disappointment, but it's about, can you be with your humanity? And I think this understanding helps us be with our humanity because we understand, Oh, I'm just caught up. It's not a big deal. So Mm -hmm. yeah, at times you get caught up, but you're showing up more authentically and more vulnerably in the dating process. And I would say, fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's great. Like that is far better than, Um, like you were saying, having that guarded heart. You're not showing up that way, but it doesn't mean you're always going to feel connected with that loving essence inside of you every time you're dating, because that's not all of you. And that's okay. So by just taking the pressure off, it's more likely that I will drop back to that place. Yes. And that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll drop back there more easily because it's like, oh, well, I'm just a little insecure. And then eventually you won't be. Yeah. You'll find I love yourself that. back. I do like that um, sort of um, the choppy waves and the ocean analogy. So, you know, when I'm insecure, I'm just, I've just caught up in some waves, but I know deep yeah. down that it's just temporary again. And so not exactly a big deal of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Like the last thing you want to do is make that mean something that then you need to like fix or do something about it. It's like, no, that's just the human experience. And like you said, it's going to, you're going to drop out of it probably a lot quicker when you're just allowing yourself to have that experience rather than thinking it means something. Mm-hmm. I think it's also helpful just to stay in the present moment and not to sort of get too far ahead and and have too much on the outcome like the, the lady before sort of was, was pointing to. Yeah. It's like that's your that's your common sense. You yeah. know, your common sense is gonna say, yeah, I probably don't want to reel that back in, get back to the present moment and you just follow that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That's gorgeous. Thanks so much for your question. It's been lovely spending time with all of you. No, that that reminds me as well of one of my favourite quotes by Jeff Foster, who said, um, feelings are there to be held, not healed. Um, Mm, Beautiful. Like, we don't have to be afraid of those those feelings because we're built to hold them as well. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have that resilience. Yeah. (laughs) thank you so much for all of your questions and thank you Rohini for being here it's been really really lovely to to explore with you and um yeah just really really beautiful so thank you very much Uh, (laughs) is there thank you is there anything you want to share with us before we go I'm just going to do some announcements announcements but um I always offer kind of you know if there's anything you're working on that you want to share with us so people can find out more about you or anything like that then is there anything you want to well, I can give you, um, I have a free ebook on relationships. I can give you that link if you want to share it with people. Yeah, that would be and, um, any links on the, um, on the, yeah, where the replay is held. Absolutely. Well, so. Yeah. And people want to learn more. You can always go to my uh, website, rohiniross.com. Yeah. Perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm just going to do some announcements about next week. Um, so if you need to disappear, then feel free, but I'm just going to carry on and just so everybody else knows the rest of the plan. <laughs> but thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll hang out and listen. Cool. <laughs> so next Friday, uh, the 15th of May, uh, same time, 8 p.m. BST, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. I thought it was about time that I shared my own story <laughs> as part of the summit because I realized I was like, oh, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> so uh, I shared it on plenty of podcasts but (laughs) um, I'm kind of diving into it a bit more so yeah I'm going to show up and talk about how we can 
rediscover our true selves and our possibility. Um, so I'll be sharing my own journey of self rediscovery really and how I kind of moved from feeling very lost and broken um, and again trying to fix, force and change things um, through self-help to seeing that it was actually kind of about rediscovering who we really are beyond all thought um, and how that kind of gave me this kind of foundational grounding of wisdom for me to really find this settled space um, and then how that kind of then allowed me to really unravel a life that I love um, because I, I then began to see that we can play in being human as well so that's <laughs> that's quite cool <laughs> um, so yeah I'll be talking all about that um, and then the week after that we have the wonderful Bill Pettit joining us um, which is very exciting so that's that's another great one um, and Judy Sedgman is then going to be um, joining us the week after so there's a, a great couple of ones coming up um, with them as well um, and also um, I also have a self rediscovery soul which has um, a foundations program um, which I'm just doing a first round with um, a beautiful bunch of people so the next one is in July so if anybody's kind of interested in that you can kind of register your interest over on my website which is nicolebarton.co.uk um, and just kind of yeah have a little see if that um, is calling to you because it's just about kind of really grounding ourselves in the principles and, and getting that felt experience of them rather than kind of trying to understand them and figure them out too much. <laughs> um, and as ever, if there are any kind of questions, um, I'm over in the Self Rediscovery Community of Connection Facebook group um, to answer all of those. So, and, and I'll pop all your links at Rohini in, in with the replay because this gets stored in the member vault area where all the other replays are there've been loads of different speakers so if anybody wants to catch up on those they're all they're all in there as well so um so yeah that's it really but thank you again Rohini it's um it's oh, really thank you and um, and thanks everybody for joining us and for your beautiful questions as well it's been yeah sending everyone lots of love yeah lots of love Mwah. thank you <laughs> everyone take Bye. care have a great weekend